everybody. Welcome to Butterfly Talk. My name is Sylvia. I'm your hostess. hostess. And um, I'm sorry I haven't done a video in a while. We've been dealing with a lot of uh, stuff for Nikki's um, care. They've been denying bandages and now he has problems with his G-tube. He had another surgery. He has another surgery coming up. It's just, it's just a nightmare. Uh, life of a special needs mom. And I, you think after 25 years, well, almost 25, Nikki will be 25 in November. Um, you get used to it, but you do, you don't get used to it. There's just so much involved in caring for a child with EB. Um, it's insane. So anyway, before we get started, I got my bangs back. I'm so excited. Um, I had decided I had worn bangs my whole life, ever since I was a little girl. I always loved my bangs, and but I always, always often wondered what I looked like without the bangs. And so during the lockdown, I thought perfect timing to grow out my bangs, and I just hated it. I just hated it and so cut them yesterday my husband's really happy <laughs> he loved my bangs so um before we get started of course I wanted to show you the jewelry of the day this is a beautiful little butterfly and it has an N not there for Nikki I think it's on the side I can't remember isn't it beautiful? And it's like gold plated. And I'll put a link to it. I, I you know, I, somebody got it for me from Amazon. I had it on my wish list. So that was really sweet. And then, of course, my EB shirt of the day. It's this one. Uh, the worst disease you never heard of, right? And of course, there's always that um, that people say don't call EB a disease, it's a disorder. Um, uh, and they're correct, but there's a lot of conditions that are very similar to EB that are called diseases. So there's a lot of very big, you know, um, confusion on what to call it. Um, skin disorders and then skin diseases. Uh, this is not specifically something that you catch. There's a lot of diseases that are uh, genetic. And uh, but anyway, that's a whole other. This is a whole other um, video. Um, and today, of course, I am, because I don't think I showed you this yet, or if I did, it was like uh, really short, my happy cat lady. And if I find little Oliver, I will I will show it to you guys. I couldn't find him earlier. I was like, I need to show everybody Oliver. He's this little bitty Persian. I'll put a picture right here. My little guy. He's so cute. Anyway, so today I wanted to talk about um the basic care tips for a baby with eb and i found this amazing amazing uh pdf online from stanford and so i'm going to put a link underneath because i'm reading right through from that from that pdf and this pdf was made by uh, lorraine spaulding which was a great friend of mine she's a mom with an rdeb child as well um, her son is Garrett and he's only two months younger than Nikki so there we've always been together doing this and she actually works at Stanford so and of course it was edited by um, Anna Bruckner which is an EB uh, doctor dermatologist uh, with EB specialty now on the basic guide in the table of contents first you get basic care tips and then there's an overview for treatment and then there's a few sections Sections one is protecting the skin. Section two, skin care and bandaging. Section three, supplies. Uh, section four, skin concerns. Number five, nutrition. Number six, anemia. Number seven, constipation. Number eight, additional complications in some forms of EB. And section nine, genetic implications. I'll go through these kind of fast um because uh, otherwise this video is going to be uh, two hours long um but i just wanted to give you a little you know my experience a little bit into it of course my son is rdeb the different forms of eb are quite different from each other and so you know keep that in mind um they start with the basic do's and don'ts and um so a lot of times they say don't touch eb kids can't be touched they can be touched uh, don't be afraid to hold them um, it's not really so much the pressure it's the shearing is this kind of thing but pressure is okay 
Um, so don't don't be afraid to hug him, touch him, hold them, whatever you got to do. Um, and another do is um, do educate yourself about, especially for the form of EB that your child has, because they they can be quite different in many things. And so you need to kind of become your own, you know, researcher and advocate. Um, do not be afraid to ask questions. Um, that was one of the things that I think at first I was even afraid to sound stupid, but you know, this is, this is so unique and so rare that you got to ask questions. You got to really think about what a professional is telling you, you know, and, and keep, keep asking questions. Um, do experiment. Do some, you know, you're going to have to experiment on what works and what doesn't work for you. Even two kids with the same diagnosis may react differently depending on what, um, what's going on with them. So be careful with that. So experiment. Um, do not use adhesives such as band, uh, just those uh, band-aids things, nothing that sticks to the skin. Um, and if you do, just uh, use baby oil to take it off very, very gently, very, very slowly. Um, do pop blisters because, as we know, they have a tendency of growing. So you got to pop the blisters. Um, uh, sometimes you need to do more than pop. You need to kind of like make a little slit. So some people use uh, scissors, just those little, little baby scissors. They're all, of course. Um, do not remove the blister skin. Uh, from the blister because that'll serve as a as its own little bandage. So it's a perfect bandage. Um, uh, do not uh, okay. Use very soft clothes, very soft bedding, um, satins and silks, and, and work great. So keep it keep that in mind. Everything has to be soft. Uh, don't pick up your child under your armpits. Um, Pay attention where the wounds are, and you gotta, you gotta really, it's, 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 um, it's a juggling, uh, thing on what a baby is, you know. So, and as he gets older, it gets heavier, and so, the pressure is gonna be harder. It's, um, you know, you're gonna learn. You're gonna learn on your own pace. Um, and then it says, do not take your child temperature rectally. I'm not even sure who does that at this point, but um, we use those uh, temperature that even just don't even touch the skin, that just feel it. And nowadays with the event of COVID, you'll see those around everywhere. So do that. Um, and then there's, there's an overview of treatment. Okay, and it talks about um, bandaging, uh, primary care, primary goals of EB care is protecting the skin against the trauma, prevention of infection, uh, maintaining a, a perfect um, level of nutrition. Um, and you'll, you'll read all of that. That's kind of like basically what, what we, we would need to do. Now then it starts with section one, which is protecting the skin. Now this, this is really different depending on the type of EB. Um, the, the friction is what, what's the most, um, what's the most, um, how should I say it? It's the most detrimental, um, for, um, children with EB, babies with EB, even adults with EB, um, it's not like they get, get over it. Um, so you gotta be mindful of that. So pick clothes that are soft, breathable fabrics, um, just, um, when Nikki was little, instead of using um, stretch nets, I used to use just leggings, and that worked out really good. Uh, but just something snug that holds the bandages in place always works best. Um, shoes, uh, yeah, shoes. Um, some kids can can wear them, some kids can't. Nikki wore wore slippers most of the time. Um, when he was going to kindergarten and then he, I had found some amazing shoes that he could wear with him. They discontinued those and I never found anything. So it could be a give and take because if the feet are bandaged, you can't really fit into the the shoe. And so you have to have special shoes and maybe they are too heavy for them to, to walk. And so it's kind of like, a, again, it's another um, trial and error kind of thing. Uh, newborn comfort. Okay, for... Um, for newborn babies, it may be necessary to lay them on an absorbent pad rather than use a diaper. I don't know. I use the diaper, uh, but I cut 
the, 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 the elastic so that wouldn't rub against them. Um, and um, of course the Velcro closures are desirable because of the better absorbency they say with the little extra padding. Of course I always padded Nikki's waist so that would be protected from from the bandage from the diaper and um, you know it's another one of those things. I mean if you want to try to to cloth diapers you know um, those are the things that you can try. Um, for beddings and car seats, sheepskin is an excellent padding material. We love sheepskin. We use sheepskin everywhere in the car and on his, on his bed, on everywhere you could think of. So um, it's awesome. And of course, silk. Um, silk is great for the pit pillow um, to have something really soft um, that doesn't shear anything. Anything that grabs a hold of the skin. Um, it's really bad for you children, so you got to be careful with that. All right, so now section two, skin care and bandaging. Um, okay, so I mean, we tried the best we can, but there's going to be blisters. There's just no question about it. Um, um, and so depending on the form of EB, you'll need to uh, bandage them uh, to avoid infections and avoid... Um, the the wound from getting festered and you need to allow the the moisture is important with our DEB so they can heal properly and heal back with the strength because otherwise they'll get scar tissue and scar tissue is not as strong as normal skin so you want to make sure to bandage what you can with the recessive dystrophic of course um, you get an area that needs moisture to allow to heal properly because scar tissue is really weak skin and it will uh, break down really easy um, uh, and then you need to figure out what kind of supplies what kind of wound care supplies you need and um, there's many different things out there I mean there is uh, zero form there's Vaseline gauze and this is for those forms be where you need moisture to heal and then there's other things like Maplex that absorbs all the nasty um, all the nasty stuff that comes out of the wound it, it absorbs it all so it keeps the wound clean um, but again, trial and error, trial and error, try different things. Um, they talk about here on the list about having a clean, clean surface set aside for your bench supplies. Um, Mepilex transfers, um, rolled gauze, tubular netting, uh, just have all of that ready in, in advance. I mean, you don't need to, but I think it'll go a lot quicker, um, if you, if you have that in advance, already in advance. Um, and of course bandaging as as the child grows older it becomes more tedious. You need to make sure to have the child uh, distracted. I think to me that was the most important thing for my son to be distracted. And of course when you're changing bandages you need to always, uh, you know, uh, you need to do, give, give them a bath. And so, I mean, I, I gave Nikki a bath until he was probably about, I want to say 15 or so. And then he started having real, real issues with the bath. It was just way, way too painful. Um, um, but when you do, I, I wish I could still do it uh, because that was great. That kept his um, wounds, uh, you know, infection free and everything. And so, um, uh, you know, make sure that, you know, the water has to have a little bit of, disinfected in it so that's why they say to put a little bleach in it um and let me see what they say about that here um about the bleach no it doesn't really say anything but i was always told that uh to put a little bleach in it um and of course being in the water helps take off some bandages that may be stuck and so that helps a lot um I always put Nikki in the bath with the bandages on and then we would take him off in the bath. And so, and then there would be some who didn't want to take off in the bath, we'd take him off afterwards. And it was a, it was a big ordeal, um, especially as he became older. When he was little, it was not such a big thing, but as he grew older, it was more and more of, an, uh, of, a, of a problem. So there's that. Then they talk about uh, blister popping. Of course, I talked about this before. I had to make sure that the tear in the blister is big enough so that it doesn't refill. That's huge. 
and um, and then leave the skin on because that serves as a natural bandage. Um, and it talks here about several good methods to pop blisters, and they include using a sterile needle, a scalpel, a scalpel, or very sharp tiny scissors. That's that's our favorite right there. Sharp tiny scissors. Uh, keep in mind where the blister will be draining and pop it at the lowest point along its edge so that gravity will further assist it in draining the fluid. And that's that's very important right there. Um, and then it talks about moisturizing the skin um, using lotions, creams, ointments, that kind of thing. Uh, because they say dry skin is more likely to itch and so itching of course is one of the major reasons why these kids get uh, blisters in the first place. Um, uh, so uh, just be careful on not using too many um, antibiotic ointments because then the body gets used to it and it no longer work. So um, that's one of the things and they do um, say something about Aquaphor. Aquaphor is great. Um, I personally, uh, for wounds, I prefer um, the um, diaper rash cream. I know it sounds weird, but 40% uh, oxide, um, not oxide, sorry, um, zinc. Um, it really helps with the healing, and so we've been using that since Nikki was a baby, and it always works. Um, and then, of course, bandaging. Um, there's no one-size-fits-all with EB. Um, heck, there's no one-size-fits-all on one person with EB. On certain places on Nikki's skin, I bandage a lot, and on some, I hardly bandage at all. It just depends on, on how prone of for wounds that area is how nasty the wounds are in that area you just it's all it's all about what's going on there and I always suggest for a wound it's a heal it's a wound that is like weeps a lot just use something like Mapalax to absorb all that yucky stuff um, and um, just keep it moist the moisture is, is huge especially with RDEB I, I would say so just um, first layer of bandages um, it would be something like zero form or Vaseline gauze and then put the Maplex on top um, and then you can wrap it. I usually put something like Webrol on top or um, Curlex just to give it that bulk so that if it does itch um, it doesn't really hurt hurt himself and so and then I put you know the roll gauze on top so that actually works really good for us and nothing ever gets stuck. Um, let me see what else. Um, okay, so that's uh, pretty much, and you can read it. Um, it talks a lot about it. Then we got helpful hints. Uh, medical gloves are not recommended because they tend to grab the skin and cause more damage. So, no good. Uh, soaking the bandages um, helps prevent sticking. Um, so if you use uh, Vaseline gauze or... Um, or zero form and you don't feel like it's soft enough you can put more aquaphor on it or creams any creams I mean like I said I use the acetin we use a variety of things I even put CBD oil on it I mean I put all kinds of stuff nothing ever gets stuck with us um let me see um what else uh, supplies okay um let me see what they say supplies da -da -da. Oh, where to get the supplies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you'll need to worry. You'll need to work with your insurance or with Medicare. We're dealing with it with that right right now. Um, uh, try to talk to other parents that live in your state. I mean, it's really useless for me to talk to uh, tell you how to do it. Other because different states, different counties have different rules about the stuff. So try to find somebody that works in that state. And just so you know, Medicare, Medi-Cal, whatever you live, um, does do ban does pay for bandages. So, um, so work with your insurance, and make sure to tell them this is a DME product, durable medical equipment, the Mepilex that's deemed like that. And so, um, I know we were just told by the insurance that the only way they would cover Nikki's uh, bandaging supplies if we went through a home health agency and so yesterday we put in a referral for a home health agency so where a nurse would come once every so often and bring us bandages so so we're just still waiting to hear about that it's just you would think that after 24 years this would have been solved for us it's not so not that crazy anyway 
and then as far as tools go, uh, sharp scissors. We have so many scissors in this house, it's just crazy. Um, bandage and scissors are good because they really cut through cut very well, that kind of stuff. Um, let me see, then the tiny scissors are good um, for blisters, you know, for that kind of thing. Uh, let me see, um, needles, of course, needles, that's a, yeah, that's all about it. And then ointments, and they, of course, they, lift, they list the aquaphor, but um, they say petroleum jelly and zinc oxide, and that's what I use, and AND ointment is also recommended. Um, it is possible to get ointments covered by the insurance company. Yeah, it's a given. It, again, it's a crapshoot over there. We we'll, we'll, shall see. Um, let me see what it says. Any product containing active ingredients should only be used after consultation with your physician. Anti-itch creams, for example. Active ingredients may be excessively absorbed through skin wounds. Yeah, I mean you have to really be careful. These are these are nasty wounds, um, especially for recessive dystrophic. These are second-degree burn-like wounds. So these are these are nasty wounds, and so you got to be careful in thinking about what you're going to put there. Um, talks about non-adherent dressings, of course, the Vaseline gauze, Mepitel. Mepitel, we liked it for a while, but Nikki decided it was just not good for him, and so we let it go. Uh, Roll gauze, um, Curlix, we use that. And then, of course, the netting, um, which, you know, if you have a little kid, or even if you're an adult, you know, you can use uh, leggings. Leggings work good to keep everything in place. That's uh, I highly recommend it, especially if it's a little girl. Although Nikki is a boy, he used it anyway. Um, section four, skin concerns. All right, so infections. Okay, so this is, this is something that we always worry about, is infections. Um, uh, and I, I don't even need to read this, um, something about foul smelling. It smells like rotten eggs and it looks bright green. That's how you know you get you have an infection. And the reason why we love Xeroform is because that pretty much nip, nips it in the bud. It takes, gets rid of any infection. We love Xeroform. And so that's how I highly recommend it. It was first given to us when Nikki had his first hand surgery. That's all the doctor used was Xeroform. And I'm like, what is this? And he said, it's, it has antimicrobial properties. And so you can use it to get rid of infections. And we've used that ever since. So that you got to be really be careful about. Um, antibiotics are best used sparingly, uh, but it's very important to finish an antibiotic program prescribed. So be careful with that. Um, body temperature considerations uh, in all form of EB is important to monitor body temperature. Um, again, you just got to do what you got to do, right? Itching, oof. Yeah, itching is a major problem. Nikki is on a medication called um, hydroxazine, and that worked pretty well for him. I mean, he used to be on Benadryl, that kind of stuff, but that made him kind of sleepy. Um, zero, uh, hydroxazine does not. So um, so it says here you, over, there's over-the-counter stuff, which um, but you can get a prescription for hydroxazine for itching. That works really well. And it's funny because when I think it doesn't hurt, when I think it doesn't work, and then I decide um, I won't give it to him today, and he just like crazy. I know it works. So, all right, section five: nutritional concerns. Okay, so um, with EB, of course, the scarring is in the esophagus as well, especially with RDEB. I'm not sure about the other forms uh, because, of course, my line of expertise is my son, and he has RDEB. So he scratch, he, he gets blisters and stuff on his esophagus, and it's awful. Um, and so, um, good nutrition that prevents him from eating well. And so, when he was three and a half, he was deemed failure to thrive mainly because he couldn't eat enough to sustain him. And so, he was put on a G tube. Um, so, let me see what it says here. Good nutrition is fundamental. Uh, protein loss and fluid loss from blistering and skin breakdown also contribute to these demands. Um, simply getting an EB child to eat more is challenge as blisters and sores in the mouth and throat often make feeding painful. Yeah. Um, so you need to, uh, you know, of course at first when they're babies, 
the mouth is also filled with blisters. You have to remember that. And so that could be really, really painful for a baby to, to suck. And that's exactly what happened with Nikki as well. So uh, they recommend a Haberman feeder here. And it's true. That's exactly what we used. The Haberman feeder is actually a, uh, it's a, it's a nipple for the bottle. And what you do, you basically squeeze the milk in the baby's mouth with it. Um, it was made for babies that are born with a cleft lip and pa cleft lip palate. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> because they couldn't suck. And so they had to do use that. And that worked really good for Nikki. Nikki used that until he was three years old. I mean, that's how well it worked. So, um, because anything, any rubbery thing that you put in a baby's mouth, um, it's going to create a blister. And so we had all huge issues with that when he was little. Um, for older children, introducing many tastes and textures is important. Mouth and throat involvement um, that produces discomfort can cause baby children to develop an aversion to foods. Yeah, I mean, if you think a regular child can get an aversion to food, can you imagine if your mouth is in pain all the time and you just eat something that doesn't taste good? It's 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 going to be a lot worse, not only mentally, but emotionally and physically. And so, um, so be aware of that. Be aware of that. Um, and then, of course, it talks about supplements. Um, I used to give Nikki um, an extra iron, a ferrous sulfate, when he was little. And, of course, after that, he started having to get um, iron um, infusions. Um, there are many ways to boost calorie and protein intake as well as vitamin and mineral requirements. Um, carnation instant breakfast can be added to whole milk or can supplements such as Pediasure, Ensure, and Nutrin, to name a few. Um, and so that works good. Then you can have, uh, you can add powdered milk to soups, sauces, cereal, cereal, cereals. This is my Italian guy to me. Puddings and so forth, boosting the calories. Try to boost calories. I remember putting uh, whipping cream um, into uh, his milk because it would it would create so many calories for him. Then here it talks about feeding tubes. Um, yeah, feeding tubes. Um, it may be a necessity at some point. Um, it seems like hard because this is a child with this whole awful condition and you don't want to have to have surgery to put a tube in him but at some point it becomes uh not even a choice anymore you have to do it and that's that um children with g-tubes can be fed throughout through the night by the way of pump that slowly drips a controlled flow of formula directly into the stomach via the g-tube uh, and it says here, the placement of a G-tube offense is overwhel overwhelming, but it can truly be beneficial and maybe removed when your child no longer needs to have it. I mean, of course, in our case, uh, Nikki never really not need to have it. So that's that. Uh, section six, anemia. Um, anemia is common complications um, in all forms of it being not just recessive dystrophic. Uh, many factors contribute to the development of anemia, the most common being chronic loss of blood and fluids due to the blistering and open wounds, um, limited diet, poor intake, absorption of blood building, blood building substances. Oh, see, I can't even speak. Also contribute to this problem. Um, <clears throat> blood transfusions, uh, iron infusions is going to become a part of um, your child's life. Hopefully not, but you know that's a, it's a possibility. Uh, in the future. Uh, and of course you can give iron uh, supplementation, uh, which I still do even though he gets iron infusions um, regularly. Constipation. Uh, oh gosh, there's another one that I don't like to talk about, but it becomes an issue because if the poop is really hard, if you try to push it out, it's going to tear all the the skin of the anus off and so you can imagine how painful that could be um uh, we had to um i mean we tried everything we tried grape juice grapefruit juice uh, all those stuff that they they oh prune juice that's what it was sorry prune juice uh but it didn't work and so he ended up doing using Mar marilax or the other brands they have store brands from marilax that are cheaper um 
I actually get this um, from uh, Sam's Club and I really like it and I, I can put it right here it's it's a lot cheaper thing than the actual mural axe and it works just as well so um, I how do you recommend it it says here um, uh, several factors contribute to constipation um, and it's physiological imp implications should not be overlooked it was really hard for me to I just can't it was just so painful um, um, this leads to severe pain during bowel movements and children would then in intentionally hold back from having a bowel movement worsening the constipation I mean, it's just awful. So just keep that in mind. Miralax, it was a lifesaver from lifesaver for us. Then of course, um, diet and nutrition. Um, uh, you need to include as you can fruits, vegetables, whole grains, dairy, meat. I mean, you have to follow the proper nutrition, and if you can't, then wow. that's when nutrition supplement comes in. Um. And uh, try to increase the fiber, um, such as prunes. Yeah. <laughs> Encourage a high intake of fluids, uh, such water or juice. You know, it's 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 there's so much to it. You know, it's not just the skin disorder. It's it, everything is is um, implicates complicates everything. And then supplement supplements and medications. Um, of course, yeah, and it talks about there's a lot of stuff in the market for relief of constipation. Um, they don't specifically say Merrillax, but Merrillax is what we use. We also like milk and magnesia at some point. Um, that worked really well for Nikki. So, um, physical activity. Okay, this is a hard one because you have to imagine a child with, that gets blisters on his feet. How is he going to walk or run or anything? Um, and of course, severe EB children become less active. Um, and um, you need to encourage them to walk, but you got to do it in a way where that they don't hurt themselves. So, um, you know, so you got to don't hold don't hold back don't don't hold them back if they want to go. And try to learn to skateboard or whatever let them do it I mean I Nikki wanted to go on the tricycle he went on the tricycle and then he fell one day and never went on it again but I didn't stop him from going on the tricycle you know um, let them set their own limits you know um, and uh, even though you, you're sitting there <laughs> thinking of the wounds you're gonna have to you know deal with later you know but they know they know especially if they're a certain age they're six seven they know they can get hurt you know and so um just it's hard emotionally and mentally it's really hard as a parent to watch them but you gotta let them set their own limits um additional complications in consideration this is from section eight um Contractures and deformities. Okay, this is mostly for our DEB, as far as I know. Um, contractures are shortened, tight areas of skin, ligaments, and tendons that often lead to decreased function in an extremity. Um, you will see a lot of our DEB children with fists on as for hands, and that's because they, the, there's so much scar tissue. Scar tissue is, does not grow like normal skin. Scar tissue is not soft. It's not malleable. It's, it's, it's horrible skin. And so it just kind of traps the fingers inside. So um, that's what happens. And this is why, you know, I've always used moisture on Nikki's fingers um, and wrap them. And I can definitely put a link to the, my, my wrapping um, um, I had, I think I have a wrapping hens video, and also have uh, on my AB Info World website. I had um, something that explains how to wrap the the hands. Now Nikki doesn't have the greatest looking hands, but he can use them. He can type with his little fingers and stuff, and so he has some usage. So um, if you feel that's important for your child to have hands, then then you can do that. Um, they said swimming is a wonderful sport for EB children and a good form of exercise. Um, 
and if they can do it, they probably need to do it with the bandages on because of the chlorine, right? So, um, um, and they said the chlorine in the swimming pool is a wonderful antiseptic. So if you have a pool and where you can do the pool, because obviously they're not going to let your EB child with all the bandages go into a pool with other people. I mean, that's not going to happen. And so if you have a pool in your backyard, that would be a good thing to do if they're um, do it and if not just gently stretch it does work but you have to remember they're in pain and so it's 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 a I feel like it's almost a lose-lose situation um when we tried to get Nikki to walk more his feet got so bad he never walked again so um one of those things right okay and then it talks about fusions of fingers and toes called syndactyly um the types of this type of scarring can be aggressive and is one of the most debilitating effects of EB in terms of normal day-to-day -day functions. Um, and it talks about bandages. This is while not completely avoidable, there are methods that may prevent dramatic or dramatically delay the complication. And so that's why I was talking about the hand hand bandaging. Um, again, I'll put the links on the bottom of this video. Um, let me see. Next, eye problems. Oof. Yes, uh, in certain forms of EB, particularly the dystrophic form, the cornea um, and the conjunctiva, which is the mucous membrane covering the eyeball, can be damaged. These tissues contain the same inefficient connecting fibrils as the skin and easily tears and scars. Um, even rapid eye movement can put a blister on the child's eye. Isn't that crazy? So anyway, um, so when they get a blister or a wound uh, in the eye, it's extremely painful. They have to be in the dark for a couple of days. Um, um, you can put, it says here, a regimen of eye ointments or eye drops helps add lubrication to delicate eye tissue. If you can co have your child cooperate with this, I highly recommend it. Nikki never cooperated with this. He said, I'd rather get a eye, uh, a eye, uh, what, the, what did he call it? Uh, uh, eye corneal abrasion, that's what he called it. Then you get putting that on my eye every night. And so, you know, it's up to you guys um, what you can do and what your child will let you do. Um, and then, of course, there's the dental problems. Uh, dental problems because you can't really brush like a normal person. The gums will bleed, you lose skin all over your mouth. I mean, it's just a nightmare, right? So cavities and other tooth problems are a big problem with EB. Um, many EB children have their tongues fused at the bottom of their mouths, making it difficult for them to move food and saliva. And so um, that's another problem. So there are different kinds of brushes that one can use. They, there's like a little brush with a little um, sponge at the bottom. If, I'll, if I find it, I'll, I'll put a link over here. Um, um, and then there's like these little bitty, they're tiny um, Q-tips. And then you can put it in there and just trying to go in it and get it clean. Um, it's hard though, I mean, because Nikki only drank milk, he never really had any bed cavities. And so, um, thank God for that. Um, let me see. And then it's also hard finding a dentist that knows anything about a bee that can help you out. And so that's, that's an issue. Immunizations. Um, okay. Um, children with a bee should get immunization, especially to prevent any of those skin, um, you know, more, uh, can you imagine a child with EB getting a rubella or, or those, those childhood skin diseases? I mean, it's just insane. And so I gave Miki every immunization I, I could. And as soon as we could get COVID, we did. He got, Niki got his COVID vaccine, um, in March. So he got the Johnson and Johnson one, and I'm so happy we did that. We, we picked the Johnson & Johnson because it was just one shot. But um, after my son and my husband got the Pfizer and Moderna ones, they were sick for, you know, 
12 hours and I, there's no way I could have seen Nikki sick like that. So anyway, I just, I just uh, veer into side of caution um, as far as that goes. Um, section nine, genetic implications. Um, it says here that there are approximately 25,000 people in the United States suffering from one of the inherited forms of EB. There's also a non-inherited form of EB that is caused by an autoimmune damage to certain structures in the skin, although it's, it's, it's even more rare. Um, the inherited forms of EB are caused by abnormality in the genes. Um, um, for some diseases, only one need to be abnormal to produce the disease, and these are called dominant disorders. Um, and they may be passed from the child from an affected parent. And these are simplex and dominant, and dominant dystrophic. So I'll put that over here so to explain. So if the parent has it, the child has a 50-50 chance of getting it. Why 50-50? Because it's a dominant. So the, the child would only inherit one of the two from an age parent, either your dominant gene or your recessive gene. It's easier to think of it as, as your as your eyes, right? So say my dad, my dad has blue eyes. So obviously that's his dominant gene. He got his blue eyes from his dad. My grandma, his mom had green eyes. So, um, so he inherited the blue eyes from my grandpa and he inherited the green eyes as a recessive gene from my grandma. So he has those two. So when, when we were born, so we, had, we got one gene from dad and one gene from mom. So we either got the blue or the green from dad, right? So I happened to get the blue. My other sister happened to get the blue. And my little sister got the green. So for some reason, my mom's gene for the eyes were like discarded. All, all in the recessive. They're all recessive, I suppose. But that's how it works with EB as well, right? So if you, if you inherit it, you're going you're gonna to have it because it's a dominant condition. So, so simplex and dominant dystrophic are, you have a 50, if you have it, you have a 50, 50 chance of giving it to your child. With the recessive, um, recessive ones though are different. Uh, recessive genes are automatically recessive. So, uh, parents, uh, like I'm a carrier, obviously, if my child was born with this, um, and the only reason why Nikki was born with it is because his dad also has a recessive gene for this. And unfortunately, he inherited both recessive genes. And so that's how he got um, he got the recessive dystrophic. And recessive forms of EB are junctional EB, all forms of junctional EB, and recessive dystrophic. Um, the dominant forms of EB are a lot more common than the recessive forms because you know, um, the parent has this, you have a 50-50 chance of getting it. And that's why um, when you look at the statistics, uh, simplex is the most common form of EB. Um, and that's because of that, because it's a dominant condition. Uh, let me see what else it says. Um, da -da -da -da. So in general, there is a 50% chance of passing a dominant form of EB to the baby, while the recessive forms of EB, the chance is only 25%. So my ex-husband and I, both carriers, we only really had a 25% chance of having a child with EB. Um, but unfortunately, our first baby um, had, had it. He was still born at full term. Then I had a miscarriage, which signaled to me that probably had it as well. And then, of course, Nikki was born with it. So it's like 25% of each pregnancy, but each pregnancy, it's a, it's a roll of the dice. You could go um, you could go many pregnancies without even having it. You could be a carrier and marry a carrier and never having a child with B. Or you, or you could have all your children with B. So it's just a, the roll of the dice, right? Um... Unaffected brothers and sisters or children with a recessive form of EB may be carriers of this disease. And it's very true. 
Um, we actually tested Connor. Connor is not a carrier. So he and I could I already knew that in a way because he had my skin. It was really obvious he had my skin. He definitely didn't have his dad's skin. And I had my dad's skin. And so I know that the the faulty gene I inherited from my mom's side of the family. Um, and it was interesting because my mom had an uncle that died a few months old and they don't know why he died. And so that could be it, right? And also on um uh, Nikki's dad side of the family, he inherited his dad's skin. So that means that faulty gene must have come from his mom's side. And the interesting thing is that his mom had several siblings that died in infancy. And so, but we don't know why. She doesn't know because she was a little baby. She is not like they ever told her. So who knows if that played a part in it, you know? We'll never know. Anyway, so that's that. Um... And I came to the end of this. <laughs> so again, I'll put the link of this amazingly helpful uh, basic EB101 um, care for your newborn baby. And I hope this was helpful. And let me see if I can go find Oliver to show you. Okay, I'll be right back. And here we are. Everybody meet Oliver. Look at him! Isn't he just the best? Huh? Huh, you? He's so soft. Anyway, thank you for watching. If you like the video, please, uh, please give me a like. It'll help the channel um, create more traction, create more be awareness. I would really appreciate it. And if you can subscribe and uh, turn on that bell, I would appreciate that too. So until next time, Bye! <laughs>